Siendo exactamente Very las... well. Been 10, 6 Chilean time, we have allowed the time for people to join us. We're going to hold now this virtual crop quality with crop quality seminar on hard red winter and soft red winter. I'd like to express my appreciation to Justin Gilpin, the CEO of Kansas Wheat Commission, and Jason Scott, a producer from Maryland. Both are experts in my opinion. They are the most knowledgeable people about their wheat classes. We are here in Santiago. We as UIT, we continue carrying out these virtual activities because we can broaden our audience greatly through this medium. I would like to tell you that there's an icon at the bottom of your screen with a little globe icon where you can pick your language. We're going to provide services of English into Spanish and Portuguese, Portuguese into Spanish. Therefore, you can pick the language you prefer to listen to. Likewise, questions at the end, and Justin Gilpin, and also uh, Jason will be here to entertain them. You can ask them in your native languages, and the interpreters will provide interpretation. Therefore, you can take advantage of that. We kindly ask you to keep your microphones muted unless you are the person speaking. So to start this virtual session, uh, I start once again ex expressing my appreciation to your attendance. Thank you. Jason, I think, uh, excuse me, Justin, I think he hasn't mentioned, but probably he's passing the floor to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Oswaldo, for the introduction and beginning the presentation. If you're okay with it, I'll begin to share my screen for my presentation. Okay. Fantastic. Buenos dias. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you this morning about the hard red winter wheat crop for 2022 in the United States. Uh, this is uh, uh, your region is a very uh, important region to U.S. wheat growers. Uh, I work for the Kansas Wheat Commission, uh, representing wheat farmers in Kansas and then uh, also supporting U.S. Wheat Associates efforts and carrying the message from the Kansas wheat farmer and the U.S. wheat farmer, specifically with hard red winter wheat. So this morning I'm gonna talk about the sampling and testing that goes into the hard red winter wheat quality that's shared with you on an annual basis to give you background on where that data is coming from and how it's uh, uh, derived. I'll give you a background on the U.S. winter wheat crop conditions, the acreage and some yield prospects and total production and how it ranks to previous years. And though, even though it's very early on, we'll give you some early thoughts, not just about yield prospects from the wheat harvest, but some early quality indications that are very promising for this year's hard red winter wheat. So one of the reasons why U.S. wheat farmers support U.S. wheat's initiative in presenting this quality data to you at a timely manner is not only to give you that information, but in an effort to try to share our farmers' stories. The more information that you have as a, as a customer and with your business will hopefully help you with your business decisions as you go throughout this next marketing year with this 
transparent and reliable market and crop quality data provided through U.S. Wheat Associates. Even though we're 70% through the wheat harvest, the weekly harvest updates and price reports provided by U.S. Wheat Associates are a good resource and tool for you to use in staying up to date with information and your marketing decisions. And hopefully uh, providing this information and connecting through this virtual seminar that will help give you a resource for any questions or information, but then also beyond this presentation and this seminar in the future, you know you have a reliable resource within US Wheat Associates or directly in the States through your wheat, uh, local wheat commissions to answer any questions we can assist with. So when talking about the 2022 hard red winter wheat, Southern Plains data that we have that would be more Gulf tributary as we're just now getting into the PNW hard red winter wheat data, it's important to understand that samples begin getting collected in May. Texas is where the harvest begins. And as we progress throughout the summer, harvest progresses northward in the United States and samples are collected at a time, not right when harvest begins, but they wait till there's 30% of the harvest is completed in that area before they collect the samples to make sure it is representative of this year's harvest. That collection and management of the samples is done by Plains Grains Inc. Uh, that is their website if you wanted to go uh, and, and visit the, that data set. And then the data that's collected by Plains Grains Inc. feeds into U.S. Wheat Associates crop quality booklets that are available uh, on the uswheat.org website. All of the testing for the hard red winter wheat data is done at the USDA Wheat Quality Lab located in Manhattan, Kansas. This is a snapshot of the USDA milling lab where the hard red winter wheat annual samples are collected uh, and then uh, put into composites and then milled for your information. Having a third party like USDA doing the samples helps give us a reliable and third party verification of the data uh, that we can share to you as our customers and for our farmers to have a better understanding of this year's crop. It's important to understand also that this lab does testing and breeding of experimental lines. Uh, so not only do they perform the test on the annual crop harvest survey, this lab works very closely with wheat breeders throughout the United States on an annual basis, ex testing experimental lines and giving quality feedback to make sure that new varieties when they come to the marketplace meet the quality expectations of our customers and market demands. The Plains Grains uh, website uh, is, is a good tool uh, if you would want to visit it that is specific to hard red winter wheat data. Uh, they have a dashboard for looking at this data for you by uh, grain shed throughout the different regions, growing regions in the United States. There's multiple quality factors that can be examined on the Plains Grain website, as you can see the, uh, from Texas through Kansas, Nebraska, up to uh, Montana, then into Idaho and Washington, different quality factors. And it's also a nice tool to be able to do comparisons on years past on how this year's crop data uh, is performing. I think this is a good year to be thinking about how past years may relate to current year. Uh, for those of you that were around in 2018, I will reference this later in my presentation, but from a hard red winter wheat quality situation, it looks to be, if I had to compare it to a year similar to the 2018 year, which was a very favorable quality year for hard red winter wheat out of the United States. U.S. Wheat Associates has, uh, will be uh, performing later in the year when they have all the quality data from all of the classes, uh, crop seminars, but then also 
the crop uh, quality booklets that give very detailed analysis for each of the classes of wheat grown in the United States uh, for this year's harder and winter wheat uh, data will be composited by by protein, but then all and then also an uh, average of total production on how the quality uh, factors are for you to use uh, as a resource tool in making your marketing and purchasing decisions and in communications with your suppliers. So if we take a look at the U.S. winter wheat crop, uh, we'll take a look at uh, first understanding the crop conditions and understanding where we're at in our harvest progress, understanding uh, the implications from the planted acreage and yield expectations. And then now that the crop is getting into the bin, understanding a quick look at some of the early harvest reports on the quality data. The theme with this year's hard red winter wheat crop is the is that the United States had the Southern Plains has been impacted by uh, a drought throughout the last nine months to a year that impacted this year's growing season. So putting it in re uh, perspective to the last six years of the hard red winter wheat crop conditions ratings, you can see that the impact from those uh, lack of rainfall and dry conditions had the 2022 hard red winter wheat crop uh, in the lowest rankings in the crop uh, rating from good to excellent in comparison in the last six years. You can see the last few years have been favorable conditions where we've had higher yields and a little bit lower protein. But in two of the years where we've had uh, another year that was similar to this year with uh, lower yields and, and stress conditions was 2018, and you can see that uh, even this year's yields uh, and condition was uh, below uh, the rating from 2018. And looking back at the last several decades of yields, there have been yields increasing for hard red winter wheat as management practices and varieties have improved uh, for the hard red winter wheat growing uh, farmers. But this year you can see because of those drought stress conditions, we are below that trend line yield, uh, taking a, a little bit of a step back uh, due to those uh, the stress conditions with this average of 48 bushels per acre. Just to highlight the, the drought areas that impacted this year's hard red winter wheat growing region, you can see the blue dots on this map indicate the, uh, the wheat growing regions within the United States. So you have the soft red winter wheat areas in the eastern part of the United States that my friend Jason Scott's going to give you uh, an update on. Got soft white and winter wheat up in the P&W areas uh, for this year. Spring wheat isn't shown on this map. This is just the winter wheat. Your spring wheat areas are in the, the northern plains of the United States. And then the Southern Plains, where the majority of the hard red winter wheat is grown in the United States, that's Gulf tributary, but then also can flow to the PNW to be exported off of the West Coast. You can see the challenges our farmers were faced with, with the uh, extreme and exceptional drought uh, from, from this year's growing region and a large growing area for the hard red winter wheat. So I'm located in, in Manhattan, Kansas. This is the state of Kansas, uh, which is the largest hard red winter wheat producing state in the United States. Uh, we talk about the variability uh, of this year's crop, how we had ranges from very low yield uh, hard red winter wheat to some more average yields and why there was that variation. You can see that the drought impacted the western part of the state more severely in the central uh, part of the state. And then of course, Oklahoma and Texas and parts of Colorado uh, were impacted more severely uh, through production because of the drought areas. In the latest USDA July crop, crop, uh, crop progress um, report, 
just to show uh, where we're at for total hard red winter wheat production. This is a, when the United States uh, puts out a winter wheat production number, they do include, they do not break it out by hard wheat and soft wheat. It's a all winter wheat production. And that's where this 1.2 billion bushel number comes from for the United States, where you can see that's 6% lower year on year. And then specifically with the hard red winter wheat uh, areas, you can see the states, Kansas is down over 26% year on year. Oklahoma is down uh, more severely, down 36%. Montana, uh, the northern states, because they were, were impacted by drought last year, they're just beginning harvest now. Uh, the prog uh, prospects look better for the northern states that will offset somewhat uh, the lower yield seen by the Southern Plains farmers. The state of Washington and Idaho that were impacted by drought last year. Production looks to rebound uh, significantly uh, this year with better growing conditions. This is this percent change. You can see it really highlights the areas uh, from a year on year change. Uh, this is on a uh, bushel per acre yield that farmers received uh, in this growing region, in this growing season, uh, where you can see this, the average uh, bushels received off of each acre uh, in these drought areas were down 25% in Kansas, 30% in Oklahoma, 16% in Texas, 25% lower in Colorado, and lower in Nebraska. Now, what will offset that uh, is the projection that the northern states that had uh, better growing conditions this year will have improved yields year on year. The soft red winter wheat is slightly lower uh, in some states, but on average looks to be similar to last year with the soft red winter wheat that, again, Jason will touch on uh, more in depth. And looking at it by class, you can see the similarity between the soft red winter wheat production year on year. The soft white production uh, in the PNW looks to rebound nicely year on year, uh, that they'll be getting their, beginning their harvest now uh, for those bushels. But with the hard red winter wheat production projected at 585 million bushels, again, this is breaking it out by class. So, specifically with the hard red winter wheat, um, production. The story with this year's crop is the drought impacted areas and the lower production being down over 20 percent year on year. And you can see on this chart going back to 2013, that is the lowest production the United States had, had in hard red winter wheat going back to 2013. But even taking it a step further, going back uh, all the way to 1973, which I characterize as hard red winter wheat production during my lifetime, you can see that this is the lowest uh, in, in almost 50 years uh, for hard red winter wheat production uh, in the U.S. And so that's, even though we're offset total U.S. wheat production by better growing conditions and some of the other classes in the northern states, when you look at it just by class, when you hear people talk about uh, the uh, potential tightness in the hard red winter wheat stocks, I think this was important for, you, for me to include in this presentation to highlight where this ranks historically uh, for hard red winter wheat production. And to overlay that with total uh, production, so the blue line, represents total wheat production in the United States, which is, includes all six classes grown in the United States uh, from the total, uh, all of the growing regions versus just the hard red winter wheat uh, production. You can see the total wheat production is somewhat uh, better than last year because of the better spring wheat and the soft white wheat growing areas and soft red winter wheat means somewhat similar year on year, but the hard red winter wheat uh, is probably the story uh, of the six classes with the, uh, the 
because of the drought impact, similar to what we saw with the spring wheat crop uh, last year. So where we're at with harvest right, right now within the United States and why it's so important for us to try to give this information to you as timely as possible. Uh, we're 70% complete with the winter wheat harvest in the United States. Harvest started in Texas in May. We began harvest in Kansas the first week of June. And where we're at now, uh, the third week in July, harvest is in South Dakota and beginning in Montana uh, in, into the Northern states. Spring wheat conditions, which from a marketing standpoint and thinking about your uh, potential price relationships for your purchasing decisions, the spring wheat crop is something that in my future life as a buyer was something I paid a lot of attention to as well. It's important to note that as of now, the spring wheat conditions in the United States are very favorable at 71% good to excellent. Uh, there will be a winter wheat or a spring wheat quality tour that will take place next week in Montana or in Montana, South Dakota and North Dakota and Minnesota that will give the industry an indication of the yield and, and production prospects for the spring wheat crop. So I would encourage you to, to watch, uh, watch the news on, on that spring wheat tour that'll take place in the United States. And that'll happen just uh, prior to when uh, the North Dakota spring wheat crop will, will be beginning. One reason why that's important is because of the drought stressed lower uh, production areas in the hard red winter wheat uh, did have higher protein. And so from not just a production standpoint influence on the market, but from a, if you're a watching protein spreads and market dynamics with basis premiums, uh, the that spring wheat crop will have an influence because right now, uh, the early indication uh, as we're 70% into the hard red winter wheat uh, quality data testing, this is from the most recent Plains Grains Inc. data, you can see there's out of an expected 520 samples of hard red winter wheat. These are a composite of an average of 300 samples that are uh, that have been collected and testing on the whole wheat production, on the whole grains. You can see that uh, the protein levels early on are, are extremely high for this year's hard red winter wheat production. The thousand, kernel, uh, the thousand kernel weight has been holding, holding up at 30, uh, 30 grams. Test weights have been favorable at over 60 pounds and 79.6 kilograms per hectare liter and, and overall a grade number one. So the quality factors with this year's crop look to be very favorable, even though production has been impacted by the drought. So a lot of you are familiar with the concept that when you do have lower yields, yields and proteins can be, uh, have an inverse relationship. So I included this chart, the orange line shows total, this is focused on the state of Kansas, the largest hard red winter wheat producing state. Just from a production standpoint, the orange line represents millions of bushels produced each year in the state. And so in 2022, you can see the state of Kansas is projected at 267 million bushels production. From a protein standpoint, when you have lower yields, you can see the years when we have dips, the blue chart or bar chart indicates protein levels. And so see the inverse relate, I wanted to show this chart just to emphasize the point of, uh, from a protein standpoint, lower yields, higher protein, higher yields, lower protein. And this is certainly shaping up a year for the hard red winter wheat crop with lower yields and higher protein. So in a, prior to coming to work for farmers at the Kansas Wheat Commission, I, I spent some time as a wheat buyer for a, a domestic flour milling company, General Mills, 
working at the Kansas City Board of Trade, buying buying wheat for, for our flat five flour mills of, of all six classes. And so in the United States, the domestic flour milling market on a daily basis, they post through the USDA website and milling baking news uh, prints it every day as well on sozlin.com. What the domestic flour milling millers within the US are buying are paying for proteins and protein premiums. Now it's important to note that this is what the domestic flour millers are buying and is not necessarily re respective directly of what FOB offers will be for US wheat exports. But I do believe it's a good indicator if you wanted to follow this, of what the domestic mills are seeing locally and what the premiums that may be uh, what they may be seeing. For instance, if you would have uh, if you would have looked at this a year ago, because the hard red winter wheat production was higher and proteins were lower, the domestic flour millers in July had a premium of almost uh, one dollar per bushel on their basis premium between 11s and 12s. Whereas this year, I think it's important to point out to you where the current domestic basis is for proteins in the United States it is very flat. Uh, basically a 13 protein or a 1250 protein is trading very similar price levels uh, to a, a 11 protein. Now this is in large part because we are in harvest uh, there is harvest pressure right now where new bushels are just coming to the market, but it is a, a indicator of how much protein is, is abundant in uh, the early harvest from this year's hard red winter wheat crop where buyers are not having to go out and aggressively pay to source higher protein. Uh, it's coming in with just the average lots through harvest time. So it gives an indicator where protein premiums for your purchasing decisions will be uh, in the next uh, market, uh, throughout this marketing year. Of course, spring wheat will impact this, but in an identifying value for hard red winter wheat, if you were in a situation last year where you were, felt like you were paying higher premiums to source higher protein hard red winter wheat, this is shaping up to a year where you'll, uh, you'll have it looks to be a year where you'll have an opportunity to buy uh, medium to higher protein hard red winter wheat at good value and, uh, and with good performance. So that from a marketing standpoint, I believe there'll be some opportunities uh, for hard red winter wheat in the South American region this year. Something that impacts that is the Minneapolis futures, which is the spring wheat contract in the United States and watching that spread or that differential between the Kansas City hard red winter futures. Last year we saw a, a pretty extreme with a, uh, you know, at times during the, the last, last marketing year because of the short crop in spring wheat, you know, over a $2 premium and just the futures. And when a futures, spread moves to that extreme, one of the things that has to happen is basis tries to also compensate that spread. And that's one of the reasons why you saw some of the basis premiums uh, that you were faced with last year in sourcing uh, US weeds. And looking historically at this spread, 50 cent spread between with a 50 cent premium uh, Minneapolis versus Kansas City futures is what I would consider a more normal type uh, spread relationship. Whereas right now we're right in that 60 to 50 cent spread between the two. So as we're getting ready to begin the spring wheat harvest for you as a, a buyer and, and looking at your purchasing decisions, uh, I think that's an early indicator anyway that this is set up to be more of a normal, if there is such a thing, uh, type marketing year uh, for purchasing hard red winter wheat and hard red spring and soft red winter out of, uh, out of the United States. So the general themes of the 22 uh, 
hard red winter wheat crop. Of course, the soft red winter wheat crop that Jason will go into detail looks to be favorable, similar to last year with yields uh, with, with favorable quality. The hard red winter wheat, because of the drought impact, uh, are seeing variation due to uh, per region uh, due to the weather conditions where the area is challenged by drought or below average. And some areas that did get a, a little bit of rain or adequate rain, and because of the, some of the farming practices had better yields. But that's one of the reasons why you saw the variations or heard about the variations in yields this year. The kernel characteristics look to be very, uh, very strong with uh, 60 to 61 pounds per bushel or uh, high 79 to 80 kilograms per hectoliter. But proteins in the Southern Plains in Texas, Oklahoma, and Kansas uh, are above average. The functionality uh, of the flour from this year's crop looks to be good. And then if I had, again, if I had to compare it to a year in previous years, I would compare it to uh, 2018, which was a very favorable year for functionality and performance with the hard red winter wheat crop. And then just comparing the 2022 crop to the 21 uh, hard red winter wheat crop, the early indications for stability, absorption, and wet gluten with the higher protein all look to be higher year on year. One of the things, uh, even though we have the higher test weights, um, some of the kernel sizes are a little bit smaller because of the strought, uh, stress, drought stress conditions. Some feedback early on with this year's crop is that uh, milling extractions are a little bit lower. So that's uh, important to note as, as you begin taking in uh, the 22 hard red winter wheat crop on making sure cleaning uh, clean house setups are ready to, uh, to make that adjustment to potentially a little bit smaller kernels because of the stress conditions. So uh, Southern Plains, Texas, Oklahoma, Central Kansas, if you, in comparison to last year, which was a higher yielding, lower protein crop, where that might have averaged around, a, in those areas, around a 10.5 uh, protein this year, or a percent to 2% higher in protein. As harvest is progressing farther north in hard red winter wheat areas, um, we're getting into better yields. And so it's somewhat similar protein to what we've seen in the 2021 crop. Test weights have been slightly better than the 2021 crop. Thousand kernel weights uh, have been similar to slightly lower uh, from feedback uh, for the 2022 hard red winter wheat crop versus the 21. Again, uh, that is an indicator that milling extractions, last year's crop was a very good milling crop. This year's crop is uh, showing early on slightly lower milling extractions. Falling numbers in Texas and Oklahoma uh, have, have been slightly lower than last year with some isolated areas that were below 275, but on an overall average for the hard red winter wheat crop, falling numbers look to be sound even though they're slightly lower than last year. And even though we're just now beginning the, uh, the milling and the baking uh, for performance of, the, of this year's crop, the farina graph stability uh, looks to be stronger with the higher protein than 21, which is uh, uh, receiving very favorable comments from users of the of new crop, hard red winter. And the big performance looks to be very similar, if not a little bit of better than the 21 crop. So uh, with that, uh, Oswaldo, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to go ahead and, and wrap up the hard red winter week and, and turn it back to you. And then, of course, if there's any questions uh, that I can uh, answer, I'll, I look forward to communicating uh, the best answers that I can. But I want to end with being sure to, to thank all of you for, for your time, uh, for making time for this presentation and your interest uh, in, in U.S. wheat, specifically hard red winter wheat. And then, of course, your uh, current and past business in purchasing hard red winter wheat. Um, uh, this region is becoming increasingly more important uh, for uh, Kansas hard red winter wheat farmers. Uh, I look forward to the opportunity to maybe uh, be able to see you all again in person now that things are getting back to normal with travel and, and being able to communicate with you uh, any, any uh, uh, updates on 
potential plantings uh, and new varieties and new developments that we're seeing within uh, hard red winter wheat. But again, I'll stop sharing my screen now and turn it back excelente, to you. Excelente, excelente. Justin, eh, ¿vas a pasar el video de los productores de trigo que querías? Perfect, Justin. Will you show us the video from the producers? Justin, so, will, will we have a video from the producers? So we, we have a, a harvest video uh, that was made. Unfortunately, it's, it's in English without translation. And so um, if, if we can, we'll try to, uh, to show that now if that's okay. And then uh, if there's problems with it, please indicate. And then uh, we don't want to cause any um, disturbances. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Justin, for the excellent presentation, excellent presentation and for sharing us information about the hardware winter crop. Not everyone has the opportunity to know how is the day-to-day -day of a wheat producer in the U.S. So the video was excellent in that respect. As Justin was saying, and as the producer was saying on the video, there's a decrease in wheat production this year. We have drought stricken areas and protein levels average of 12% for hot red winter, 12% or greater than 12% protein levels. Not only, more protein than 10.5 or 11, but 
So this is excellent for the mill industry. It's important to mention also that there's going to be U.S. wheat available all year round from the U.S. So there's nothing to worry about that. So questions will be addressed to the speakers at the end of Jason's presentation. Okay, now you, we have the floor to you, Jason. Thank you. Thank you, Osvaldo. Um, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, and, I, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, Justin and I traveled together in uh, South America, I guess it's been three years ago, or just prior to COVID, really, and uh, got a chance to meet some of you, I'm sure, and had a really great trip down there and, and getting to see, uh, see some offices and facilities. So i um, happy to kind of follow up with this crop quality information. I do have to, to uh, thank Osvaldo for the, the kind words at the beginning. Um, I am by no means an expert on sulfur red winter. I do grow it and uh, spend a lot of time in the field and try to do my best. But when it comes to uh, the quality characteristics and uh, the kind of information you guys need for uh, purchasing and for milling, um, I know just enough to be dangerous and, uh, and I, I can certainly quote the numbers, but I, I don't always uh, have the answers when it comes to the numbers. And with that said, um, I have to thank Justin for such a comprehensive uh, presentation going over the way the surveying process works. I do have a little bit about that in my presentation, but um, I, I won't spend a lot of time on that um, because Justin went over that so well. And uh, finally, I want to thank Erica Oakley at U.S. Wheat for uh, putting these numbers together and putting the presentation together for me. Um, she has much easier access to get the numbers and uh, the, the data on the soft red winter crop and does a much better job of uh, putting the presentation together than I do or, or could ever learn to do. So thank you, Erica, for that. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. All right, so um, as I said, uh, I'm a producer from Maryland and I'm gonna give a, a little bit of an update on soft rib winter. Um, my farm is on the Eastern shore of Maryland. So between the Chesapeake Bay and the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean. Um, sorry, I wanna make sure I'm set here. Ooh. Between the bay and the ocean. Um, we grow roughly 350 to 500 acres of wheat a year, all depending on crop rotation, what the crop prices are. Um, and as you all know, the prices were, were pretty good this year. So um, we had a little bit more than we typically would. Um, and then uh, th this picture here depicts me actually spraying a fungicide on the wheat right at flowering. Um, you can see the little small yellow uh, flowers there on the wheat. And uh, that's something that in Maryland with our high humidity and uh, relatively uh, high amount of rainfall compared to a lot of the wheat growing area, that's something that we typically have to do every year, um, especially when prices are where they are here. Um, we, do, uh, we do have varieties that have some tolerance to head scab, which head scab is the disease that causes uh, Don and vomitoxin in wheat. Um, but we, you have to have the tolerance in the variety, which is native and, and bred into it by the breeders. But then also on top of that, uh, need to spray the fungicide at this flowering stage that's, that's shown in the picture here. Um, just a little bit about Maryland wheat overall this year. Uh, we were up about 9% on production from last year. Um, that was mainly due to an acreage increase. We had pretty average yields. I think the average was about 79 bushels to the acre. Um, we did have some disease problems early. Jason. Yes. Jason, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Eh, perdón, perdón por interrumpirte. Perdón por interrumpirte, Jason, pero no, no está pasando. Sorry to interrupt you, Jason, but your presentation uh, is not changing the slides. It's uh, stuck on the first slide oh, okay. with your name there. Let me see. A ver. Good. Sí. Ahí sí. Ahí sí. Ahí pasó. Yes, now we can see it. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay. Sorry about that. I think I might have hit the wrong button. <laughs> but okay, sorry. Um, 
where was I? On oh, Maryland. Okay, so uh, our crop was pretty good. We had plentiful moisture in the fall to get seeding done. And then um, also uh, plentiful moisture this, this spring. On our farm here, uh, my, my personal farm, we're about two thirds irrigated on our acres. We did run the irrigation on wheat one time, which is pretty rare for us to, to need in the spring. Um, but uh, looking at the yield maps that the combine prints out, it did actually pay off to do that. The irrigated wheat was a few bushels better than the dry land wheat. Um, a little bit more about the whole soft red winter crop. Um, the USDA is estimating that it will be up uh, about a 4% increase over last year. And that's also up from the June forecast, I guess, as uh, some of the Southeast started harvesting, the crop was coming in a little bit better than, uh, than typical. Um, on my own farm, we were up a little bit over our average. Um, our, our best fields were um, around 95 bushels to the acre. I think that that's equal to about 6.4 metric tons per hectare. Um, but we also did in our region have some frost damage and some hail damage this year, which Frost is not that rare. Um, it's pretty rare for us to have hail damage. Um, but on one of my farms, we had uh, probably our, our best wheat field going into the spring, had hail go across it, and uh, the yield was about half of what the rest of our fields were. The quality was still okay. Um, some of the kernels were a little bit smaller, but um, overall the quality didn't get affected that much. It just affected the yield in that, in that field. Um, so most of the salt red winter sampling has been harvested. Uh, we had pretty good dry weather throughout most of the harvest season. Um, and, uh, that, that has led to, uh, pretty good test weight for most of the crop. Um, I did, I did get some information out of Virginia, uh, this morning that their test weight was down a little bit and they're really not sure why this year. Um, Typically, if we get rain during the harvest season, that causes the test weight to go down. Uh, but, but they didn't really have a lot of rain, so they're not really exactly sure why. They're still looking into that and, and trying to figure it out. Um, and then also from, from Virginia, they had pretty, Virginia and kind of the southeast, I guess, altogether, they had pretty moderate scab this year and uh, a little bit earlier crop and, and drier than typical. And we'll see that as we get into the data here. Um, and then uh, I guess it doesn't seem like it's this close, but uh, we're only about 60 days away from seeding for most of the region. And we do have adequate soil moisture. Um, our, our summer crops, corn and soybeans look pretty good for the most part. So I, I, I look for at least as much wheat to be planted as was last year, um, if not a little bit more. Although I will say uh, from the farmer perspective, uh, even with the relatively high price, um, the seed costs have gone up a fair amount. Uh, fertilizer has been uh, much higher than last year and hasn't really seemed to soften a whole lot throughout the summer. Um, we're not quite to the point where we would be uh, applying any fertilizer yet, but uh, so far it is still holding the line. Um, nit nitrogen, which is one of the bigger expenses on growing wheat, is uh, still about double what it was in 2021. So that, that cuts into the profit quite a bit. Um, just wanted to talk a little bit about our weekly har harvest report, and this is uh, at the very top there, you see reliability and transparency, and that's one of the things that uh, U.S. wheat really prides itself on. Um, we want to always make sure that we are uh, the, the market that you can count on to provide you with the, the best data, and uh, that data, you know, we're not trying to hide anything or anything like that, so... Um, we have that weekly harvest report. You can subscribe to that on the website and uh, go to usweet.org to get that. And that gets emailed directly to you. Um, and you can find information on all the social media sites as well. Um, we try and do that throughout the, the harvest, uh, I guess, starting with the most Southern areas like Texas, um, and then continuing on through uh, the spring wheat harvest as well. Um, we're also happy to have our, our crop quality uh, calls now and uh, hopefully we'll get back to doing some tours and, and getting to actually get out and see some of you guys in person. Um, I, I really enjoy that much more than than sitting behind a computer screen. Although I do I do value the the opportunity to be on Zoom with you and uh, get a chance to 
to have a little bit of a conversation with, with so many more people. Um, so for the crop quality data, um, Justin talked a little bit about this. Um, we were uh, at 26 total states for soft rev winter. We are at 11 states. And uh, you can see it's quite a large geography there, um, circled, in, circled in green there. Um, I actually did get to see some samples from the, the mill that I take my wheat to. Um, they had stopped by and dropped off bags and the, the samples got shipped in. So potentially some of my wheat actually got into the sample this year. Um, and uh, it's a, a pretty comprehensive uh, sample of the area where the soft red winter is, is grown. On to some of the data. Um, and this, as, as noted there on the chart, this is as of July 15th. So pretty recent data, but not exactly final. The soft red winter crop is getting close to, to being, uh, or soft red winter harvest is getting close to being finished, but not quite. Um, so as you can see, the falling number, the test weight and the protein are all uh, a little bit higher than last year and higher than our typical five-year average. Um, the moisture is a little lower. As I said, the whole Southeast region had a really dry period for a couple of weeks during our harvest. Uh, so uh, you know, it's, not, it's not that rare for us to have to actually dry some wheat with a dryer um, because a lot of times we're harvesting at 15, 16%. But this year we probably harvested more wheat at or below 13, five to, and 13% than, than we ever have in, in my career as a, as a farmer. Um, the thousand kernel weight came in a little bit lower than last year, but is still is still good. And uh, the the grade there is uh, U.S. number one soft red winter, which I believe last year was a, a U.S. number two. Um, Frenograph absorption very similar, and then the cookie spread a little bit lower than last year's. Um, and you can see there on the bread volume and crumb. Production. I talked a little bit about this. Um, I guess more on the southeast, but um, the overall production was up about four percent. Um, we're not quite back to where we were back in uh, 2014, 2015, but I honestly wouldn't be surprised to see that go up a little bit next year, just based on um, the 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 price where it is today for next year is still a pretty good price uh, compared to you know what we typically would have. Um, this is just a, dra a graph here showing the, the winter wheat yield <clears throat> change from previous years. As I said, uh, Maryland's not even really shown on here, but we were up about 9%. Um, you can see Virginia down a little, um, uh, but North Carolina, which is a pretty big grower, uh, up, up quite a bit. Um, the middle of the country down a little bit overall for, for many of those states there that you'd be sourcing out of the Gulf. A um, little bit more about that. It's projected to be the highest since 1415 um, with more acres and also good yields. Um, we're also uh, projecting exports to be up about 11%, which would be the largest in four years. And uh, as, as typical, although it hasn't necessarily been the same the last couple of years, that soft red winter prices are currently the, the lowest among the classes and are, are competitive with other major exporters. And I've actually been, been seeing that we've been getting pretty close to uh, competitive with, with some of the Russian and, and Black Sea wheat as well. Um, so that's why we're, we're expecting exports to be up a little bit. And then we're also looking at, at uh, the highest stocks over the last four years as well. And I think uh, most of you probably know this, but just a little bit of, we always like to throw this, this slide in there with some nice cake and cookies here just before lunch. Um, but uh, some of the baking advantages of soft red winter, um, the low to medium protein is, is great for use in cake flour, pastry flour. Um, low moisture content is an advantage for the baker. Um, the finer particle size and, and on the increase of water absorption. And then, uh, you know, use, use for cookies and biscuits and crackers. That's where we really think that we have an advantage with the, the class. And uh, we also feel like uh, blending with spring wheat <clears throat> excuse me, or hard red winter, um, we, can, we can do 
really well, you know, depending on where the price is of each um, with flatbreads, cakes, cookies, those types of products. And then I'll, we always like to uh, include this slide as well. Um, you know, lower in protein, so typically is lower cost, so can sometimes offer some blending opportunities. Um, definitely remember, uh, especially years where it was maturing in wet human conditions to, to include maximum values for Don. Um, and then typically you can uh, get it shipped in, in in combination cargos. And then uh, in years where we have lower production, it's, it's somewhat harder to get because a lot of it stays in the domestic market, um, specifically for the snack food industry. And that's on my farm, that's about, you know, about half of what we grow goes up into Pennsylvania, into the flour mills there for the snack food industry. And that's, that's it. Um, again, I thank you all very much for coming. Um, happy to stay and answer and give you the best answer I can for any questions. And, and Justin may be able to help with some of that as well, even on the software winter side, because uh, with his background as a trader, and then he's always looking at, at the numbers a lot more than I am. Um, I, uh, I'll, I'll rely on him to answer some of the questions as well. And I count on Osvaldo as well. So again, thank you very much. Thank you, Jason, for your presentation and for your time and for also attending this sort of seminar to our customers in South America. Right now, we can start the Q&A session. We have more than 110 people joining our virtual session and they can ask directly on their mic or they can write their questions on the chat feature that is available also at the bottom of the screen. As Andres is, Osvaldo Seco is muted right now. I don't see any questions in the chat feature. Claudia, have you received any questions? I don't see anyone. There's two people who have raised their hands. Two of them. Can you guys hear me? Osvaldo, eh, hablan a Olga Garzón de Colombia, de Grupo Nutresa. El chat se encuentra... This is from Colombia. Well, the chat is not available. That's why we were not able to write any questions on the chat, but I'll ask the questions and I'll uh, need interpretation services. The heat wave that is affecting the U.S., You've mentioned that some areas have had some rainfall, but we're all under, do, can these heat waves affect overall production? What's your opinion about that? Well, Jason and Justin can uh, answer the question directly to you or to everyone or the person who asked the question, okay? You, any of you gentlemen have the floor, either Jason or Justin. So I'll speak um, from the kind of the software app winter area a little bit. It, it's not actually affecting us. I mean, we, we have the heat, of course. Um, and uh, I believe it's 95 degrees out uh, Fahrenheit here today. So Justin may be a little bit warmer where he is, but um, our wheat is mostly harvested, I would say 95 to 98% in Maryland and most of the soft red winter belt would be pretty close to harvested. Um, for us, it's actually uh, speeding up our summer crops. So we'll be typically getting our corn out a little bit earlier when we have this kind of heat because the, the crop is growing so much faster. 
um, which also may help actually uh, with seeding of wheat in the fall because a lot of wheat goes in after corn, especially here in Maryland. So um, really not affecting the, the wheat crop or the potential seeding for the wheat crop um, for next year for us. But Justin may have a little different story. Uh, no, I think it's a, it's a great question uh, and, and certainly something that's impacting some, some major growing areas in the U.S., but it's also important, just as Jason was saying, to highlight it's, it's very regional where those heat areas are. So this, uh, I tried to share my screen. I don't know if you can see it or not, but this is the, the drought monitor for the United States that was just issued this morning. So where Jason is over here, uh, he's he's been blessed with uh, not having to deal with the severe drought areas that are in the Central Plains still. Uh, and there's areas probably from from the impact that the high temperatures and the drought areas that we're facing right now uh, is impacting uh, corn yields in the Western High Plains potentially soybeans. You think about the major growing corn, the corn belt area has, there, there are good yields for, uh, in this area for corn. It's this area of the corn um, areas that are, that I think in the next week or two, are, you're gonna hear some pretty, uh, pretty depressing yield forecast. And so what's significant about that and what's relevant to your question is a lot of the corn usage for feedlots and for feeding is in this area where uh, there's a lot of uh, cattle feeding. And so this is a high corn use area. And because of the, of the shortfall in corn, um, from a basis level standpoint, it will probably support, will keep wheat from getting, uh, as, as these feeders have challenges in sourcing corn because of corn failing in this area, uh, they may have to source wheat, milling quality wheat for feeds. So that'll be a, a market dynamic to watch. But from a wheat planting standpoint, you know, we're still 45 days away from planting here, 30 days away from planting here. And typically in a year where you have, if you look at years past uh, when we had corn drought areas, like in 2011 and 2012, where you had similar uh, shortfalls in, in corn production due to drought, that fall where winter wheat seeding happens in the fall, we have seen an uptick in winter wheat acres that went behind corn that failed, but then also the decision made by farmers um, so that's more because of the limited uh, the limited uh, soil moisture available, uh, knowing that they're going into another crop year with limited moisture, that they may uh, increase acres of wheat that uses less moisture than than some of the row crops. So two things to watch is uh, the impacts on on basis with some of the regional uh, shortfalls in corn production but then also um, what that might mean to uh, a slight increase in, in winter wheat acres, um, maybe for a different reason, but similar to what uh, Jason was talking about. So that's, that's a good question and certainly something that a lot of our producers in, this, in the High Plains are very concerned with right now is the weather. There are some questions in the chat. Uh, Juliano de Almeida, would you like to ask a question? No sé si. Sí. Okay, I, I just make a comment in the chat, but I can also uh, ask uh, in this way. Uh, Jason commented a little bit about the scab control and the zoxinibalinol contamination in their region. And could please, uh, Justin, also comment uh, a little bit about uh, dung contamination in hard red winter wheat uh, in this year crop, please. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, so this, year, uh, this year, because of the drought, uh, the dry conditions for the hard red winter wheat, we uh, uh, really didn't uh, any any 
issues where there was head scab. Um, it was very isolated. And so vomitoxin and hard red winter wheat looks, looks not to be an issue this year. There are other than uh, some pockets uh, in the eastern hard red winter wheat growing areas and some pockets uh, in, in some of the uh, corn belt soft red winter wheat growing areas. But uh, this year uh, looks to be um, uh, a pretty sound, sound crop from that standpoint because of, of the dry, dry conditions. Thank you. Um, aquí tenemos una pregunta de Oscar. Here we have a question from Oscar and also Jose Javier. No, sorry, Alex Vega. Both have to do with hot, soft red winter, Jason, and they talk about how much has the protein uh, gone up in soft red winter in what you see this year, because this is related to extraction. And if you have information on maximum extraction of soft red winter. Probably should unmute. Um, I don't have the information on extraction. Um, I believe the protein was up about a half a percent from last year. Um, again, not really sure exactly why, because we pretty much had average yields, um, but I don't have the extraction information. Um, and we will, we'll try and get that as, as soon as we can and get that to you. Um, and I do see another question in the, the chat asking about vomitoxin in SRW. Um, we don't have all of that information together yet. Um, I would say from a personal standpoint, it was variable. Um, I had some fields that were about 1 to 1.5 part per million, and then I had some that was 0.25 or, or less, um, all depending on the exact timing of the, the fungicide application and then also the tolerance of, uh, of the, the variety, you know, the just genetic tolerance to the infection. Um, I'm getting some information actually from Erica Oakley um on some of that as well but so last year we were at 0.8 on don um i wouldn't expect us to be too far off from that uh this year and as always there, there are going to be some pockets where it's higher where you know a rain came through right at pollination or they had a week a couple days of, of rain at pollination um and erica says uh so far the information we have that the milling yield is higher than it was last year mm. Es importante mencionar que, bueno, Jason Scott es experto, pero es productor Pretend de trigo. Tanto, aspectos... Jason is uh, an expert in wheat, and so it's very early to know about extraction. It's also important to have the information that Jason told us about vomitoxin or the level of dawn in soft red winter. South America buys maximum 2.0 ppm, and Jason tells us that last year was 0.8 average. This year, there will not be a problem with soft red winter. Of course, there are some spots or counties where there may be a little bit more or less, but the average is a sound average, and this is what's important for all the people that are buying soft red winter this year. We don't have any other questions or raised hands. Uh, well, uh, we would like to thank Jason and Justin for being with us in this extraordinary presentation of the quality of the soft red winter, hot red winter crop. Also, thank Cecilia Tsukamoto and her staff for the translation services. Uh, please send us uh, through the chat or WhatsApp or phone whenever you deem uh, convenient. We will continue answering. If we have technical questions, we can send them to Jason or Justin for an answer. We thank you all for your presence. We have we had an excellent participation, more than 110 people from all over South America. Thank you again, and please uh, pay attention because we will continue having these seminars. Uh, 
So we will inform you via email or phone about these seminars. These will be quality crop or commercial or technical seminars. Thank you once again to U.S. Wheat in Washington that helped us with this seminar. And uh, thank you to all our dear customers in South America. See you next time. Goodbye. Thank you.